by the unknown. Glockheis Gledig, when they Prince of the Realm, King. The sovereignty has extended across the world's tract. Bikaya is the prison of Gwer in the mound of the fortress. Throughout the account of Pwil and Pwedi, no one carefully died in it. I have a great chance, a servant to tell. And before the city of the moon, bitterly he sang, and the judgment shall stand in bad vacation. Three full nights quit when we went into it. I died them near thee. Except seven, the rise of the fortress of the mount. I am honoured in times, said of Slade. And Kaifor picked fortress for its revolutions. And can the poetry from the cauldron it was uttered, from the breath of nine maidens it was killed. The cauldron of the chief of the moon, what is its fashion? The dark ridge around its border on the hills. It does not boil the food of a coward, it has not been tested. The flashing sword of Klaug has been lifted to it. And in the hand of Klemenauch, it was left. And before the door of hell, lamps burned. And when we went with Arthur, brilliant difficulty. Except Namen seven, none rise up from the fortress of meat drunkenness. Glorreich ledig, pendeich latri. Ich lede thi penaeth, das treith mundi. Bi gaia gacha rea, in gaia sidi. Tu ebas tu puich a fu dali. Neb kin no kef ni taith i di. Aya gadwin trom las, kewe las a ketui. A rag praidi anufun tosit geni. A gal raut par raut in bad by di. Tu chlonait puitwen, a daitham ne di. Nam saith na daraith o gaia sidi. Neit with glad gaimen, ced o chlawit, an caia petrovan, pedi a chlawit, an canaia o paia pan lefoit, o nadil na morwen, gochyn a wit. Nan paia pen anufan, pwyafan eit, Kurum am yoro am al rit. Nam beu buik luva nirata git. Kledach lich liach idaga da rit. Achim la leminach ada da wit. Arak duispad ifen chilen chlochit. Afan aithan nid gan athir. Trafeth chlathlit. Nam an saith na dalaith o gaia gfedwit. Hello, today I'm going to discuss the story of Caridwin and her cauldron and how it relates to British Druidic tradition. So to begin with, let's explain that Christianity only began to be worshipped in the British Isles around the Dark Ages, which is the time of British history after the Romans left um, until the Norman invasion. So they left in the first decade of the 5th century and the Norman invasion was in 1066 and about this time we know very little at all. 
Um, previously the Romans had brought their gods, uh, arriving in 43 AD, and Romanized British culture. Um, but the Celts also had their own worship of Druidry, um, which was recorded by the Romans, and which the Romans sought to control and to destroy. And when the Romans left, um, around 410 AD, I think, um, up to then, um, the Anglo-Saxons, with their gods, arrived around 450 AD. Um, so it was a very short time of a Christian culture between two heathen and pagan cultures. The question remains whether there was such a thing as a living and unbroken Druidic tradition. Many people claim that the Druid revival was a modern movement based on classical accounts. Still others say that they have belonged to secret societies of Druids that have their roots in the distant past. Ross Nichols, the previous Archdruid of the Order of Bards, Ovates and Druids, before the present um, head of the Order, Philip Cargon, says of the subject in his Book of Druidry, In 800 AD in Oxford there was a grove of the Ferelt, called Cor Emrys. The word Ferelt relates to a fair and to metal, as today we call iron ferric, and we can presume therefore that this relates to smiths and metal workers and their associations with magical skills. Cor Emrys means circle or city of Ambrose and links to Ambrose Aurelianus, or in Welsh, I will attempt to say this, Emrys Fleidig, who in the myth of Arthur was introduced as Arthur's uncle brother to Uther Pendragon, though this is probably a later association, though undoubtedly he was still a historical powerful figure. Um, from Wikipedia I've taken this quote, which was from Gildas the monk. So following the destructive assault of the Saxons, the survivors gathered together under the leadership of Ambrosius, who is, who is described by Gildas as a gentleman who, perhaps alone of all the Romans, had survived the shock of this notable storm. Certainly his parents had worn the purple, were slain in it. His descendants in our day have become greatly inferior to their grandfather's excellence. Under him our people regained their strength and challenged the victors to battle. The Lord assented and the battle went their way. Amesbury is also named after Ambrose. The centre of this cult was the mother goddess, Ceridwin Ceriadwin. Ceridwin, you may have heard the name, and Ceriadwin means dear one. But at this time arose the exchange between the old pagan religions and Christianity. And it is said that Christianity suppressed this cult in Oxford. Cults may have been suppressed, but Nichols surmises that the teachings of Druidry and alchemical metalworking, as he calls it, must have survived, or how else could Hamo of Favisham have revived it? Hamo was said to have revived it about 400 years later, and on his death, Philip Brithod, Bridoth, I would say, so Philip Bridoth, the Welsh poet of Llanberden Fo, 1200 to 1250, is given by Gwyn Jones to be the superior poet for the contender of the role. Therefore we can surmise that already we have a melding of poet and bard and the revival of Druidry. He reconstituted existing groves in a number of areas, mainly in Wales and parts of England. And Nicol says in 1245, Mount Hymer's Grove was established, which still exists to this present day. Then Druidry seems to disappear until the 17th century, where it makes a reappearance until about the 18th century. Many people consider this revival based on romantic historical notions and sketchy accounts from the Roman scholars. But, says Nichols, where Druidry could not be practised openly, it could carry on in Wales and Scotland under the guise of bards and having perhaps made it to the 4th or 5th century under Christ as a Christian Druidic faith. 
Now this is not unreasonable to presume, for in the lore of Ceridwyn we meet the bard and poet called Taliesin. Now Taliesin was a real person, we have surviving poems from him, and the tale goes that he received his gift of poetry from the cauldron of Ceridwyn herself. Taliesin seems to have lived because we have surviving poems. Taliesin seems to have been a living man because we have surviving poems praising Urien of Reggett, a king of what is now Cumbria, who was his patron. Nichols continues, around this time there is very little evidence of Christian burials or money showing Christian symbols, but instead Romano-British culture's sacred worship was around the hearth, and upon such a hearth the sacred cauldron boils. Many cauldrons have been found from these Dark Age societies. The decoration on these cauldrons would make one believe that they are far more than a utensil. They seem to be held in high esteem and show ritual and sacred images. The Gundestrop cauldron is a famous discovery from the Dark Ages Denmark, and Ross makes mention of the Glastonbury Bowl. These items seem to show that the bowl, grail, chalice and cauldron were all sacred items to the Celts and the Saxons of Dark Age Europe. The Glastonbury Bowl was found in the Iron Age Lake Village and it's two pieces of work joined together which would seem to indicate that it was worthy of mending. The bottom half is Iron Age and dates to anywhere around from 800 BC and the top half relates to the first century. Around the base of another of these cauldrons is a young deer which is a symbol of an initiate in Druidic tradition. From these finds and historical accounts we could then presume that Druidry didn't in fact die out but went underground and continued by being absorbed into other traditions, as Christianity had a mandate to do this anyway. From Irish mythology we have the tale of the cauldron belonging to the Dag de Mont, the elder sun god of the Celts, uh, who owned it with a magical harp. Warriors were said to be dipped into this cauldron to be reborn, and uh, in Celtic tradition the mother goddess too has many names, and many are associated with cauldrons. Anna and Dana were some of the earliest Gaelic names for the earth goddess, of which Anna is the oldest. The name Dana is clearly given in the name of the people of Dana, the Danaeans, and these may be Greek, or in Irish mythology as the, I will attempt to say this, Tuta de Danan. <laughs> Ceridwen Ceriadwen is seen as the crone, moon mother, or Sibyl and Ceres. She is worshipped in Druidic tradition at two or three main times of the year. Nichols mentions around February at Evolk she makes an appearance as the nurse of seeds and it is the time when seeds are beginning to grow and germinate. Um, then in Lunasa in autumn um, she is also mentioned uh, by Yuri Leach, which I'll come back to in a minute. And in October at Samhain, Nicole calls her the planter of seeds. So she's associated with seeds and with February, the beginning of germination and towards harvest time, towards winter, which was considered one long season in Celtic thought anyway, which is all winter. We will see much of her in our counterpart of Bridget, Goddess of Smithcraft, Poetry and Healing from Irish legend. And St. Bridget was reputed to be the nurse of Christ, associated with mid midwinter and Ivalk. She too has a sacred cauldron and is a fire goddess. Ceridwen is associated with the sow, a very motherly creature. The old hen, the hind, and is also known as the wolf mother. On the Gundestrop cauldron, most famously, is the figure of Canonus, but here I would say we also see a goddess holding the slain warriors, perhaps with their feet to be dipped into the cauldron of regeneration and rebirth. Although Caradwyn is said to be the consort of Belinus, who is the sun god, in the Welsh stories her husband is Tegidfoil. As moon mother, her name has the same roots in care. This could be translated as horns, Although, some, again, some say this is the Welsh for crooked or bent. The same root can perhaps be found in Ceres, the grain goddess, a kernel of corn, perhaps, and also um, in Welsh, Ceth means poetry or song. 
She also has some associations with death as seen by her standing at the gates of winter. The two principles of creation in Celtic thought were the sun and the moon. The sun was symbolic of the life force of creation and the moon symbolic of instinct and reflection. In Druidic thought there was the notion of metempsychosis. This is reincarnation into different forms depending upon actions in each lifetime. One could be reborn as an animal, an insect or a human, depending upon your actions in each life. A soul could progress or regress. We see much of this in the Druidic poetry and story, such as the story of when the hero goes to find Mabon, um, and so he has to find the oldest animal, which is a salmon. Or in the poems of Taliesin, uh, the Battle of Godo, for example, or Gotho, where he extols all the forms he has taken. There was also the belief in Druidry, says Nichols, um, that earthly souls go to the moon before being reborn, but when souls had progressed beyond reincarnation, they went to the sun. Caridwin, of course, is known best for the story of Taliesin and the cauldron of Arwen, or inspiration and poetry. Taliesin's name is of interest. Of it, Nichols says the god names Tut, Toth, Thoth, Tututes, Tahuti, Egyptian form of Thoth, and Hu the Mighty are all similar god forms. He is He or Hu or Hesus or Asus. The earliest god form is Ace, which relates to the Scandinavian Asia. He is growth or the seed. As Hu or He or Hesus in Druidic Celtic lore, he is also known as Hu Gardon, a Heracles in strength, leader of the Cymric people. He is linked with another Zeus like figure. Tyrannus. He is likened to the child Gwion, transformed to Talysin. Now Talysin was a real man. He was mentioned in the Saxon genealogies and lived in the mid-sixth century. He authored several praise poems to Urien of Reged. Later authors recorded these for posterity. His grave is reputed to be Trey Talysin, near Hlanginfelin although this is actually a Bronze Age burial chamber. He's also referred to as Talisin ben Beath, chief of bards and poets. He was said to be a great poet and was able to prophesy, prophesying the death of King Melguin Gwyneth from yellow fever. So these, are, so these are the historical facts we have. The tale is somewhat different. If you do not know the tale, Keridwin had two children. Her daughter was beautiful, but her son was ugly and excelled in neither wit nor wisdom. So Caridwin set about to boil for him a cauldron of inspiration, and she gathered together nine herbs and set them all to brew in a cauldron for a year and a day. And she hired a servant boy, Guillaume Bach, and a blind man to keep the cauldron boiling and to stop it from boiling dry and to keep the fire lit. And for a year and a day he laboured at the work. But at the end of that time, three drops splashed out of the cauldron and burnt his hand. And seeking to soothe his flesh, he sucked his finger and all the potion's magic was consumed by Guillaume The rest now of the potion was utter poison, absolutely useless to anyone. Um, in that instant, Taliesin then knew everything. But he also knew that that Caridwin would mean his death. And so he ran, and he changed himself into a hare, and ran across the land. But Caridwin changed herself into a greyhound, and she hounded him ever the closer. And so Taliesin changed himself into a bird, and flew through the air. But Caridwin changed herself into a hawk, and she hounded him ever the closer. And so Taliesin changed himself into a fish, and dove into the waters, but Caridwin changed herself into an otter, and she hounded him ever closer. And so Taliesin at last changed himself into a grain of wheat, and he hid amongst all the other grains of wheat on the threshing room floor. But Caridwin changed herself into a black hen, and she pecked and she scratched until she found that one grain that was Gwion back, and she swallowed him whole. Now that was not the end of Guillaume Bach. 
For nine months later, Karen Twin gave birth to a boy. And this time he was so beautiful, she did not have the heart to kill him outright. And so she bound him into a bag of skin and, get, and set him floating downstream. Now then, now to cut a long story short, Elfin, son of a king, was an unlucky lad who had been plagued by constant bad luck and had many debts to pay off. And so his father, the king, granted him the fishing rights of the Weir of Gwythna so that he could pay off his debts. And so he set out his nets, but on that day he caught no salmon. But instead of catching the sack and thinking that it might be something valuable, he pulled it out of the weir and opened the bag and out leapt the child with light shining from his face, so that they called him Talisson, Radiant Brow. Alfin lamented that he had found nothing of value, only an orphan child, and immediately Talisson spoke these words. Ah, fair Talisson, cease to lament, let no one be dissatisfied with his own. To despair will bring no advantage. And the prayers of Hlinlo will not be in vain, and God will not violate his promise. Never in Gwydno's weir was there such good luck as this night. Fair Elfin, dry thy cheeks, being sad will not bring, uh, will not avail. Fair Elfin, dry thy cheeks, being sad will not avail. Although thou thinkest thou hast not gained, too much grief will bring thee no good, nor doubt the miracles of God. For although I am little, I am highly gifted. From seas and mountain tops and from the depth of the rivers, the gods bring wealth to the fortunate man. Elfin of lively qualities, thy resolution is unmanly. Thou must not ever be sorrowful. Better to trust in God than to forebode ill. Small as I am on the foaming beach of the ocean, in the day of trouble I shall be of more service than three hundred salmon. Elfin of notable qualities, be not displeased at thy misfortune. Although reclined thus weak in my bag, there lies a virtue in my tongue. While I continue thy protector, thou hast not much to fear. Remembering the names of the Trinity, none shall be able to harm thee. And it's said that from that time forth, Elfin had good fortune and was of good cheer wherever he went. Of the, state, of the tale, Yuri Leach, who is a writer and artist, says of the, the plot. Um, today, which is the 8th of August, is the actual day of Lunasa, the, uh, the midpoint between summer solstice and the autumn equinox. It's also the cusp between 18 degrees of ivy and 18 degrees of broom in the Celtic calendar. This is a very special day for bardic initiations and it is what the whole story of Ceridwyn's cauldron is about. She gave birth to Talisson on May Eve, Beltane, after carrying, him in, after carrying him in the womb for nine months, which meant that she conceived him at Lunasa. That the Ceridwyn story of Stolor is quite clear from the beginning. Her cauldron has to be stirred for a year and a day, which is the old way of saying a complete year, a 365 days is a quarter day too short, hence a year and a day to complete the cycle. The Hannes Tallison is quite clear that it was a star or right too, as she is described as studying the books of the astronomers. Anyway, here's the magic. Guion turns himself into a hare and she turns herself into a hound to chase him. The constellations Lepus the Hare and Canis Major the Great Hound are next to each other. Guian comes to a river and changes into a fish. The constellation of Eridanus, the river, and Pisces, the fish, are next to each other. And then they become two birds. The constellations of Cygnus, the swan, and Aquila, the eagle, Aquila, the eagle, are next to each other. Finally, he turns into a grain of wheat, and she a black hen. Spike of the brightest star of Virgo is an ear of corn, and Corvus the crow is her, as a black hen. And yes, they are next to each other. She eats him and nine months later he is reborn as Talisson, Radiant Brow. A brilliant style or story through the elements. Hare and hound are earth animals, fish and river are water. 
The two birds are air and the grain and conception is fire and internal alchemy. So then, in the story of Tullison under the protection of the great mother goddess, we can see the origin of Tullison the Bard and the roots of Druidry as it has been preserved over the centuries. Keratwin, who is the Sybil, represents the transforming power of the initiator that produces from a simple serving boy the power of the Bard. The Bardic traditions have been passed down in Wales and Scotland for centuries through such activities as ice depots the first recorded of which took place in 1176. We can see that this is a long tradition from the first few centuries when Rome tried to suppress the Druids, with a certainty that if the tradition is not actually continuous, then it has indeed been a very long one. In conclusion, the tale of Caridwin is fundamental to the understanding of Druidry and the ancient pagan wisdom traditions of the Celts. Transmuted through the symbolism to the three drops, we may see that many a riddle holds such wisdom, and in many a story many secrets are contained. And as such, these things have been preserved, even till the modern times. The Battle of Godot I have been a multitude of shapes before I assumed a consistent form. I have been a sword, narrow, variegated, I will believe when it is apparent. I have been a tear in the air, I have been in the dullest of stars. I have been a word among letters, I have been a book in the origin. I have been the light of lanterns a year and a half. I have been a continuing bridge over the three score of mouths. I have been a course, I have been an eagle, I have been a coracle in the sea. I have been a complaint in the banquet, I have been a drop in the shower. I have been a sword in the grasp of a hand, I have been a shield in battle, I have been a string in a harp, disguised for nine years. In water and in foam I have been a sponge in fire, I have been a wood in the covert, I am not he who will not sing of a combat through small. The conflict of the Battle of Gothau of Spriggs against the Guli Digapur then, there passed central horses, fleets full of riches, there passed an animal with white jaws, on it were a hundred heads, and a battle was contested under the root of his tongue, and another battle there is in his occupants. A black sprawling toad with a hundred claws on it, a snake speckled, crested, a hundred souls through sin shall be tormented in its flesh. I have been in care of anything near, through the hastened grass and trees. Minstrels were singing, warrior bands were wondering at the exaltation of the rhythm that the Quillion affected. There was a calling on the Creator upon Christ for causes, until when the Eternal should deliver those whom he had made, the Lord answered them through language and elements. Take the forms for the principal trees, arranging yourself in battle array and restraining the public, inexperienced in battle hand to hand. When the trees were enchanted in the expectation of not being trees, the trees uttered their voices from strings of harmony. The dispute ceased. Let us call it short, heavy days. A female restrained the din. She came forth altogether lovely. The head of the line, the head was a female. The advantage of a sleepless cow would not make us give way. The blood of men up to our thighs, the greatest importunate mental exertions, sported into the world. And one has ended from considering the deluge and Christ crucified and the day of judgment near at hand. The elder trees, the head of the line, formed the van. The willows and quicken trees came late to the army. Plum trees, they are scarce and longed for men. The elaborate medlar trees, the objects of contention. The prickly rose bushes against a host of giants. The raspberry brake did what is best failed for the security of life. Privet and woodbine and ivy on its front, lie first to the combat that the cherry tree was provoked. The birch, notwithstanding his high mind, was late before he was arrayed. 
not because of his cowardice, but on account of his greatness. The laburnum held in mind that your wild nature was foreign. Pine trees in the porch, the chair of that distribution, by me greatly exalted in the presence of kings. The elm with his retinue did not go aside afoot. He would fight with the centre and the flanks in the rear. Hazel trees it was judged, that ample thy mental exertion. The privet happy is his lot. The bull of the battle, the lord of the world, Moragamorid, were made prosperous in pines. Holly it was tinted with green, he was a hero. The hawthorn surrounded by prickles with pain at his hand. The aspen wood has been topped, it was topped in battle. The fern that was plundered, the broom in the van of the army, in the trenches he was hurt. The ghost did not do well, notwithstanding let it overspread. The heath was victorious, keeping off on all sides. The common people were charmed during the proceeding of the men. The oak, quick moving, before him tremble heaven and earth a valiant doorkeeper against an enemy. His name is considered, the bluebells combined, and caused the consternation in rejecting were rejected. Pear trees the best intruders in the conflict on the plain, a very wrathful wood. The chestnut is bashful, the opponent of happiness, the jet has become black, the mountain has become crooked, the woods have become a kiln, existing formerly within the great seas. Sign was heard to shout, the top of the birch covered us with leaves, and transformed us, and changed our faded states. Branches of the oak have ensnared us, from the Grachian Maldurch, laughing on the side of rock. The world is not an ardent nature, not of mother and father was I made. Did my creator create me of nine formed faculties, of the fruit of fruits, of the fruit of the primordial God, of primroses and blossom on the hill, of the earth of an earthly course, when I was formed of the flower nettles, of the water of the ninth wave, I was enchanted by math before I became immortal. I was enchanted by Gwydion, the great purifier of the Brithon, of Uriz and Oron, of Oron, of Modron, of five battalions of scientific ones. Teach us, children of math, when the removal occurred, I was enchanted by the Gulidig. When he was half burnt, I was enchanted by the sage, of sages in the primitive worlds. When I had a being, when the host of the world was in dignity, the bard was accustomed to benefits. To the song of praise I am inclined, which the tongue recites. I played in twilight, I slept in purple. I was truly in the enchantment with Dylan, son of the wave. In the circumference in the middle, between the knees of kings, Scattering spears not keen from heaven when came To the great deep floods and the battle there will be Four score hundreds that will divide according to their will Are they neither older or younger than myself in their divisions? I wonder, can here are born every one of nine hundred? He was with me also, with my sword spotted with blood Honour was allotted to me by the Lord and protection where he was. If I come to where the boar was killed, he will compose, he will decompose, he will form languages, the strong-handed gleamer his name, with the gleam he rules his numbers, they would spread out in a flame. When I shall go on high, I have been a speckled snake on the hill, I have been a viper in Hlin. I have been a billhook crooked that cuts. I have been a ferocious spear with my chosable and bowl. I will prophesy not badly, four score smokes on every one that bring. Five battalions of arms will be caught by my knife. Six studs of yellow hue, a hundred times better is my cream-coloured steed, swift as the sea mew which will not pass between the sea and the shore. 
Am I not preeminent in the field of blood? Over it are a hundred chieftains. Crimson is the gem of my belt, gold my shield border. There has not been born in the gap that has been visiting me, except Gronwy from the dales of Edirnoe. Long quite my fingers, it is long since I have been a herdsman. I have travelled the earth before I was provisioned in learning. I have travelled, I made a circuit, I slept in a hundred islands, a hundred cares I have dwelt in. Ye intelligent druids declare to Arthur, what is there more early than I that they sing of? And one is come from considering the deluge, and Christ crucified, and the day of future doom, a golden gem in a golden jewel. I am splendid and shall be wanted from the oppression of the metal workers.